Thank you so much, um, um, Tabina, for this kind introduction and also for inviting me to be part of the Media Lab. It's a huge honor to be here. Um, indeed, I've just returned after a four-month sabbatical in uh, DC, and now I'm in Berlin again, which is uh, hot but not humid today, at least. So <laughs> it might be raining in the next days, though. Um, I'm very happy to give you a sneak peek into the book. The book will be out next month, hopefully. So the final proofs are sent back. There's nothing coming back from the publisher. So that's it. It's done. And uh, we're very optimistic that um, um, it will hopefully be of interest. And I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, interested also to know how a, a US-based audience would engage with such a book. It, it resonates with many um, uh, global discourses also about uh, minorities, marginalization, cultural citizenship, and what um, minorities can do to use the media uh, to be their voice. Um, I've, I'm, I'm giving a brief um, presentation um, for the first maybe 15 to 20 minutes. And afterwards, I hope that we can engage in a discussion based on questions from the audience or, um, or from you. Um, I will start sharing my screen and I hope everything works uh, the way it did earlier in the test <laughs> uh, version. Yeah, I think you see my presentation right now. And I maximize the screen and uh, then I'm going to full presentation mode. So, yeah. I will start now. So I'm introducing the book. As I said, it's called Arab Berlin Dynamics of Transformation. While I'm doing the presentation today alone, um, I have a co-editor in the book um, who's a, a legal scholar of uh, Palestinian origin, and she works at the Humboldt University in Berlin, Nahid Samour. Um, but I'm just doing the presentation today because um, alone because I'm focusing on the media aspects as related to media lab. Um, so uh, that's the um, book cover. Um, and so it, it will be also published open access uh, with transcript uh, publishers, a German publisher. And here I would like to briefly um, introduce the points I'm going to cover. So first of all, um, why Arab Berlin? Why do we need such an input? And I would like to uh, briefly explain the evolution of the project and the book structure and its core arguments. And then I would like to uh, take you in three deep dives into the book, into selected uh, three chapters. The book consists of 25 chapters uh, in six parts, but I will um, describe more about this uh, later. And it's edited by myself and Nahid some more, as I've said. So why Arab Berlin? Why do we need that book? First of all, um, Berlin has been evolving lately in the past um, 15 years to um, since the Arab uprising space, it has been evolved and emerging um, hub of Arab intellectual life in Europe. It was spurred by the failed Arab uprisings in the Arab region, in particular by the Syrian uh, civil war, where um, the majority of the Arab newcomers in uh, Germany come from Syria. Um, and particularly in the wave um, in 2015. So there is an increasing visibility of Arab um, academic, cultural and economic productions in Berlin scene because the second wave of uh, um, Arab migrants belong to the white collar and, and the intellectual and professional um, elite in their home countries and not as in the migration waves in the 60s and 70s uh, belong to the blue collar, which um, have shaped also um, the Arab uh, presence in Berlin or in Germany uh, as a whole, but more in less visible uh, spheres, not publicly connected to um, a changing culture or a changing uh, media or um, production into the public sphere. So we see the, they bring evolving transformations, or Berlin witnesses evolving transformations in fields of migration, education, but also memory culture and contesting discourses on German soil, um, and, and also the security discourse, discourse and law. And um, I mentioned security discourse because, um, as you know, or as research shows us, um, the Arab is being constructed always in terms of othering, in terms of a negative stereotype connected, ty types connected to Arab clans, 
um, to a rise uh, of criminality or uh, conflation of uh, terrorism and Islam. So um, we are trying to give nuances to what Arab Berlin is. More about that also uh, later. Um, oh, by the way, I would like to say that um, most, if not all, pictures here uh, are um, done by a photographer uh, called Iman Hilal, who, uh, with whom I co-authored a chapter in the book, and I will um, introduce also her properly. This, for example, is um, a place called Mosaic. It's a space, cultural engagement space, where they um, have books, they have um, also food, and, um, and sometimes uh, sell um, ethnic uh, clothing and host um, like weekend parties for some cultural events and stuff. So the book uh, is based or developed within a, a project that is funded by the Senate of uh, for Higher Education and Culture in Berlin, which is called Global Berlin in the 21st Century. We are one of four funded books uh, or funded projects within this initiative. And it is a multidisciplinary project that puts the questions on where Berlin is heading in its global aspirations. Just an example, another um, project had nothing to do with migration and minorities, but rather centered papyrus and museum cooperation, the papyrus collection in, 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 in Berlin or museums, for example, is world renowned. Uh, another uh, parallel project uh, centered the medical um, um, and health tourism in Berliner uh, hospitals. So here we um, centered Arab Berlin as a topic for our um, project. Um, that's briefly why Arab Berlin. Now I would like to introduce the book structure and its core arguments. Well, first of all, we think that the core argument has not been made. So this is why we need the book, you know. Um, we ask whether a city with a multicultural facade offers true equality for all its citizens and non-citizens. And when we use the word non-citizens, we mean the people with who are, do not have the German citizenship, who do not have the German passport. And here we um, reflect uh, in particular on structural and legal discriminatory um, processes and outdated uh, laws. Um, why we say multicultural facade? Because Berlin has this world reputation that it's synonymous, synonymous with freedom, especially since the Cold War. Even its university is called Free University in Berlin, the one that has been established in the Western parts. And um, it's, um, it's also a, um, a city that attracts people with different lifestyles. And it, it has this liberal undertone. Um, and this is, but sometimes we feel for minorities that are marginalized, this multiculti or this multicultural uh, coexistence can sometimes be a facade when it does not offer full equality. For examples, um, some examples we we'll bring in the introduction of the book are the housing market. The housing market in, in Berlin, it's a, it's a city that's been that is being increasingly gentrified as major other European cities have witnessed. Uh, London, Paris have gone those tra uh, trajectories and Berlin is going also into that uh, trajectory. So um, um, finding a suitable housing um, for affordable prices has, been, has become a scarcity. And within this scarce market, we witness and several um, indicators and uh, reports show that people with Arab or Middle Eastern last names tend to get invited less. There's even a story, a newspaper story about it, why Mustafa is not being invited why, uh, for, for, to, to, to see the apartment while Hana is being invited. So you, you see, um, this is what we mean by the um, a facade, you know. Um, Arab Berlin engages also with Berlin as a site of critical transformation that are gro globally situated. So the fall of the, um, of the um, Iron Curtain or of Berlin Wall, um, the latest changes, even the latest war in Ukraine has left also its traces in, 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 um, in Berlin. So there, it, it is um, a space of resonance uh, within the European continent. And it also, and, and the whole book uh, narr narrative is positions also um, our uh, lens or our uh, manuscript within the increasingly polarized democracies and rising tendencies, tendencies towards the right, whether in Europe or uh, globally. 
And we, as I've said, the argument has not been made yet. We looked and scanned the market. There's no single publication with that title. Arab Berlin is not existent. So there's a dire literature gap. And we do not claim that we cover it fully. It's just a first step into a much needed conversation. Whenever you Google Arab and Berlin in one sentence, the results would show you either Arab clans, I mentioned like the, 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 the gangs, you know, um, uh, that are competing over their territories, like in, in many uh, major cities, um, or you would find Arab cuisine and Arab food, you know, street food and Arab restaurants and so on. So centering intellectual life and production, cultural production and, and media participation is, um, is still new. We also would like to move beyond the binary orientalist discourse trap, you know, either the perfect um, uh, Arab migrant who has made it the successful model, you know, like this, there's this joke about um, a standard news story about the Syrian migrant who learned German within two years only, you know, as if um, migrants need to, to learn to earn um, uh, their position in their new societies, or um, the other um, binary uh, side or the other spectrum would focus only on the stories of uh, criminals or um, devi um, uh, deviations from what is considered normal behavior. We um, have tried to adopt an innovative approach in our book. And um, we, at, at, First of all, we are attempting to return the gaze, you know, just to use to borrow bell hooks um, um, uh, terminology. The scholarship so far has focused on Arab transformations, um, especially spurred by the Arab uprisings. So usually we look at the changes in the Arab region from a Eurocentric perspective, neglecting transformations within the Arab community in Europe itself. So this is what we're trying to do here, to center Berlin as a geographic location and look at Arab inside. And it also fills the knowledge gap. Uh, as I've said, Arab Berlin shifts the perspective to Berlin as a hub uh, for the Arab newcomers, and also it enriches the discourse with new perspectives. And in the same time, we investigate dynamics of transformations. So we look at, um, at the intersections of the spheres of politics, society, and history, gender, demographics, and migration, media and culture, and education and research. Here, for example, this uh, picture you see is um, um, a, a documentation of an initiative where um, Arab uh, Berliners would have a free museum visit once a month with Arabic um, tour guides, Arabic speaking um, uh, tour guides um, in the um, museums. And um, as you know, this uh, comes originally from Iraq. So it is also uh, very interesting to capture how people um, of Arab descent in uh, living in Berlin reconnect with their own cultural heritage while it is shown in a museum in, um, uh, on German uh, soil and, and what kind of discourses and, and self-reflections it brings, but also their feeling of self-worth contributing to the, to the global um, heritage. Of course, we're also aware of the colonization and decolonization discourses. So we, we're trying to nuance and in, just entangle those discourses in the book. We have adopted a kaleidoscopic approach. So away from the purely academic language, we also mixed um, different types of knowledge. Uh, we have long articles, we have photo essays, we have interviews. Um, and we have, um, as I've said, regular academic articles, but also shorter essays, like 2000 words, like a long form uh, journalism and um, photos as well. So our aim is to really engage with the public and with um, outside of the, you know, um, elite uh, discourses of the academia. And we also reflect um, on critical encounters in Berlin from different perspectives and disciplines. And um, some of the disciplines are mentioned here on the um, um, in the column describing that the transdisciplinary approaches. Um, we have um, scholars and people who have contributed from philosophy, history, Islamic and Arab studies, memory studies, linguistics, but also journalism and media studies. So more the empirical uh, social science uh, to political science and sociology. And we even have also med uh, scholars from the fields of medicine, science communication, as well, reflecting on what Arab Berlin uh, means and could be to them. The book consists of six parts. It has 25 chapters, as I've said. And the parts are 
uh, as follows, um, exile, migration and belonging, inclusion, arts and activism, then highlights on the social life and then cultural life. Um, part five um, looks at international encounters in education. And finally, there is an outlook with um, two chapters only. The one looks beyond Berlin, so at other sites of transformation in Germany. And uh, the last piece uh, is an interview with um, um, a poet uh, originally coming from Sudan who had moved in the 70s. So he had witnessed so many transform transformations uh, in uh, Berlin and even before uh, the fall of the wall. And he also witnessed multiple generations um, of Arabs coming while he was there. So it was it's also a very um, nice and, and moving uh, interview. So you can see, so we, we tried to capture some of the um, images and sites of evolving Berlin. So uh, an, an increase of, if we start, you know, uh, with the upper picture, the classroom, this is a Sunday's um, or weekend's Arabic language school, where the increasing number of Arab migrants bring the need that their kids also would learn their uh, the parents' native language. So this shapes also the cultural life um, and the educational offers in the city. Um, another place that you can might you you, you might mistake in it for a place in Cairo or in uh, Beirut is actually also in the center of uh, Berlin, uh, called Kushari Lux, and it was um, um, founded by a German who had lived in um, Egypt for twenty years and then moved back in two thousand thirteen to Berlin and opened that place, imitating the decor and the ambiente of uh, um, an Arab street food uh, place. And then there would be uh, the religious life that also shapes uh, parts of uh, Berlin, like the mosque here below, behind the metro. And finally, also the um, streets. Whenever you come to Berlin, and this particular uh, streets that uh, or regions where the migrants uh, are and, and live in majorities, you would find entire uh, streets where there would be um, one um, cafeteria or um, cake shop or sweets uh, shop uh, next to the other, which has also shaped the culinary face of Berlin. So now I would like to take you into um, uh, three deep dives into the book. And those are um, um, not necessarily the exact chapter titles of the book, but Ambivalent Tales of a City is the introduction or refers to the central argument in the introduction. Uh, Amal Berlin is a, a newspaper um, um, initiative done by diasporic journalists. Um, Amal Berlin me means hope Berlin. I'm, I'm going to dis describe it later. And finally, Biographies in Motion is um, a recap about um, an academic artistic photo exhibition where I've collaborated with Iman Hilal, the photographer I've mentioned earlier. So I would like to take those quick deep dives with you before um, then finishing the presentation. So um, first of all, why ambivalent tales of a city? And here we obviously borrow from Two Tales of a City, uh, the famous uh, novel we, probably many of us have uh, read during uh, their school time maybe, or watched the film at least. So ambivalent tales of a city, because indeed there is no one story to tell about Arab Berlin, and we cannot claim that we can do that in one book. What we are witnessing in Berlin is what we captured um, after reading all chapters by the contributing authors and also based on our own research is that there are two contradictory processes that are happening at the same time in Arab Berlin. The, and, and they're both contrasting and going into different directions. Um, so dynamics of transformation have um, stagnation or stagnating hard legal political structure that still has traces of discriminatory laws, of a slow political machine that does not evolve as quickly as the demographics are evolving. And on the other hand, we have soft dynamic culture in Arab Berlin that is evolving so fast, so fluid and so hybrid um, that it, it shows inclusion, more inclusion than uh, the hard legal ex exclusionary political structures show. And when I when I let me give you an example, of what I mean. So I've mentioned the vibrant intellectual cultural scene in in in, in Berlin. But if we look at the um, administrative and political establishment, we would see that 
Arabs are not as equally represented as they are existing in the city, you know, so they would in, in the hard structures um, of the uh, politics, they are not really do not have a voice. But when we come to the cultural scene, they have a very loud and visible and present voice and they shape the city especially if we see if, if we include not only journalism media art scene like music film and others but even the food as an example of practiced culture and everyday uh, lived experience so this is this was our central observation there's this outdated illiberal structures which lead to stagnation and exclusion on the one hand but then on the other hand there are those innovative and fluid activities which use the vibrant cultural scene and and push discourses forward and um, they are not operating in the same speed as you can imagine. So these imbalanced discourses on Arab Berlin show the persistent power of hegemonic frameworks, which still reproduces cycles of ex exclusionary discourses of othering and discrimination. It is changing now, for example, for people who are not familiar with German politics, the parliament, um, the federal parliament is looking into changing uh, citizenship law that will make it much easier for migrants to uh, apply for the um, um, for the German citizenship. I'm saying much easier. There are still requirements, but uh, for example, re less years of uh, residency um, are needed. Um, families have um, easier um, processes, and so on. There, there. It's much. Uh, it's a little bit easier than the current law. So there are there are changes, but still they are a little bit outdated and step behind. Um, this picture oh, and the one before, this is a backyard of a, a Arab bookstore called Khan al Janoub. So it's also a, a space where festivities take place, book launch events. Our book will be launched there hopefully in two or three months. Um, in, in summer, uh, there's a cafe and a grill area where people come and authors come and discuss their books and so on. And this is a picture from the inside of the bookstore. It also has um, uh, German translations of Arab literature, but also real Arabic language uh, books that would be shipped from the region or even local uh, Arab um, authors living in Germany who would write about their um, history, uh, about their story and, and, and biography. Um, what we're also witnessing um, is that Berlin's Arab population is growing steadily. Um, and it, the city has a pronounced importance for Arab migrants and refugees. The chapter, one chapter, uh, Amr Ali, in one of his chapters in the book, says that um, Berlin has become for the Arab exile people, especially after the failed Arab uprisings, what New York has become for the Jewish uh, immigrants uh, almost 100 years ago. So in terms of condensation, people, uh, um, um, networks, some people call Berlin uh, little Beirut or little uh, Syria or little Cairo, depending on what Arab community uh, is there. And But that does not mean that we forget about the multi-layered formations of Arab presence. We cannot conflate all Arabs in one basket. And uh, there are also distinct regional differences and national differences, depending on what Arab country uh, the people come from. And it has also a complex evolution. I've already I've mentioned already the class dimension. So the early migrants from the Arab region were rather blue color, uh, and um, the recent waves are more um, white color uh, migrants, which are more engaged and and, and vocal in the cultural life. Uh, I would like to maintain that we um, in no way trying to um, adopt an essentialist approach. So there is no claim over one Arab community. Actually, we actively invited many people and initiatives uh, to participate in the book in the early recruitment phase. And many, we, we regret that many could not be part of the book. So we know that already. But even that, we are also argue against the conflation of Arab and Muslim, for example. We are aware that there are other religions in the Arab region as well. And, and also against the conflation of Arab and Middle Eastern. So those are also problematic colonial um, um, wordings and phrases that we are aware of. And yeah. Now I would like to take you in the second deep dive. And this fresh um, um, screenshot comes from Amal Berlin, the second deep dive I would like to uh, mention and um, 
uh, introduce here. Arab Berlin is a really one of uh, my personally favorite projects um, in, in when it comes to media. And it was started by two sisters, one of them, two German sisters. One of them was um, a Middle East correspondent based in Cairo who returned to Berlin um, in 2013 and started this project as, as a workshop for uh, newcomers who have background in journalism so that they would um, have a training you know, in, in, in professional uh, journalism uh, in their new homes. And from there it grew. Uh, obviously it's being funded uh, by uh, German um, cultural entities. So it's, it's a nonprofit um, project. So Amal Berlin, as I've said, it's a group of diasporic journalists who have a voice, who actually uh, produce and write the stories. Amal Berlin means hope, Berlin, and the initiative centers cultural citizenship in media and journalism. Cultural citizenship means when people believe that they are citizens and who can contribute. So similar to the voting in, in politics, um, uh, expressing yourself culturally means that you are taking ownership and, 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 and practicing your right as a citizen. Um, while it started uh, by Julia Gerlach, uh, uh, Julia and um, Corinna Gerlach, but it is it has um, or it builds on the diasporic journalists themselves after their experiences of displacement and exile. So they have the skills, but they cannot really work in their old uh, media where they have been working in their home countries. Um, Amal Berlin was established in 2017, and it's a local online daily. It has about ten journalists in the Arabic section. It has multiple other languages as well. It reports about local and federal political and cultural news in Arabic and Dari Farsi uh, for Afghani uh, journalists and also recently in Ukrainian, in addition to the standard German page. And it has several teams depending on the language department. Um, as I've said, it gives the newcomers purpose and also a welcoming space. Um, um, and with their journalistic work, Amal Berlin contributes also to a well-informed new Arab public in Berlin. So it also counters the myths and disinformation that can be found on unverified, um, non-fact-checked um, um, social media, you know, about rumors. So it offers also um, really um, verified information as in professionally checked. In their article, uh, Julia Gerlach and Abdurrahman Omarin, the editor-in-chief, they share the challenges and peculiarities that sometimes also come with reporting to a diverse Arab public in Berlin and beyond. And they also further explore why international Berlin has few non-German media outlets, while it has the demographic potential and demographic uh, market, and what can be done to make Berlin a true new Arab media city in Germany. Now it's the uh, last uh, uh, um, deep dive uh, into one of the book chapters. Uh, this is a book chapter um, that documents the um, exhibition, photo exhibition biographies in motion. It took place um, more than a year ago in May, 2022. Uh, it was based on a collaboration between myself and Iman Hilal, who was a photojournalist in Egypt before she left her home country uh, in 2015 and settled in not in Berlin, but in Hanover. And she also reflects on that in the chapter, what it means to live outside Berlin, go in and back again for work and, and, and for this project in particular. So just let me briefly uh, describe the logic of the, um, of the um, exhibition. As you see in the background, uh, there is this um, vintage um, lift it has no doors, it's running uh, in circles constantly. And the idea is that the posters or the pictures of the protagonists we chose for the exhibition are in those, um, are um, pictured or hung in those uh, different cabins and they go up and down, up and down, you know. So um, it also reflects how the biographies are in motion. There's a rise and fall. Many of them have broken trajectories. Uh, or, or broken biographies, which shows explicitly people who left the, their countries after the failed uh, revolutions in 2010 and 11. So countries like Syria, like Egypt, like Yemen, like Iraq, um, uh, uh, like Libya. Uh, we have tried to, um, to uh, like Lebanon, we, we really have tried to also represent different nationalities and different 
um, types of people. So, um, and I, I will, in the next slides, I will share selected pictures with you. The original um, photo project has more, had more than 40 pictures. The book, unfortunately, has only 10. And also the exhibition had only 12. So, but it just shows you how rich and, and, and different those stories are. I will show the pictures uh, here. So um, the oud player on the um, on the far left, he, for example, was um, um, tortured, kidnapped and tortured in Syria. And he hid the fact that he is a, a, a professional uh, instrument player because otherwise the um, state security in Syria would really would smash his fingers on purpose in the torture. So he just, he, he, she shared with us a very, sad story how he was just sitting on his hands to, in order to protect his fingers because this is his talent, this is his capital. In the center, we have Bainatna, uh, the team, the co-founding or, or the founding members of Bainatna Library. This is the first Arabic public library in Berlin. And it also offers a safe space. It has children's books. It has um, also normal books, you know, like fiction, nonfiction. So it offers also uh, a space uh, for culture. Not only that, but also within a public library. So it also is a welcoming sign. And on the right, we have um, a Kurdish, Iraqi Kurdish um, artist who um, has been also detained for a while and then made it to um, um, to Berlin. He lives in Potsdam, which is a little bit outside Berlin, 20 minutes, but still he, he's, uh, he also shared with us his new, making his new beginnings in, in a new home country. Um, here, the second set of uh, the second slide, we have um, um, the gentleman who's playing um, uh, ping pong. He's actually a, a celebrity in Egypt. He is a band member, one of the earliest underground bands started maybe 20, uh, 30 years ago in Egypt and paved the way for many uh, other underground uh, bands. And um, being a celebrity moving to a new country when you when you are a celebrity and no one knows you in, in, in the new country is of course a loss of status. So in, in, in Berlin, he, he shared his feelings about being degraded just to another um, um, man, old man from the Arab region. He also has um, a disability, so... Um, so he, he shared with us the story how sports, you know, and being and, and playing with other neighbors and people in the local club just helped him regain some balance in his new country. In the center, we have an artist who likes to play with maps. And this is why we pictured him in front of the maps he produces. So he tries to challenge our um, mainstream stereotypical view of the world. And uh, on the far right, we have uh, founders of one of the new um, language schools. I mentioned the Saturdays and Sundays Arabic schools, which no children really like to visit because it ruins their weekend. And I'm saying that out of personal experience, sending my son there. Um, but um, those they still enrich the cultural life and they bring new uh, discourses and new habits and new lifestyles to the city. So this is a glimpse of the book. I really look forward to having um, an uh, engaged discussion with you. The book will be entirely open access, by the way, and I can send to Divina also the PDF link once it's published. It will be um, available on the transcript publishers probably. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Hanin Doctor. Um, I think we can open the floor for questions, comments, just thoughts, if any, because I have a lot to say. Yeah, I'm looking forward. It's also a good practice because there's another in-person launch event tomorrow. So actually, whatever questions, even if they're critical ones, I will benefit from that, please. <laughs> Um, you can come off mute um, on video, off video, depending on uh, whatever you're comfortable with. You can also use the chat and I can read the question out to you. No real question, just very impressive work. Thank you for doing that and providing us with an insight into, into uh, things that are happening 
across the globe because it's very, very important. Um, I know I, we tend to kind of get sucked into our little silos. And so it's super helpful to, to be able to see what's going on in different places, what's similar and what's different, right? We can learn from each other and continue to grow. So thank you very much. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you so much. I, I yeah, I, I think I hope at least it also brings similarities um or or images uh, that might be familiar in, in your respective societies. So yeah. Um yeah. I, this is Barbara Harrison from Ithaca and absolutely the group may not be the same, although there is prejudice in this society since September 11th um, against Muslim people. Um, and of course, we go back to the 1600s for prejudice against people who are Black. And then you go to the late 1800s, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and we did have anti-German sentiment during World War I and the Japanese um, um, well, they weren't concentration camps, but separating Japanese people, even though they were citizens. Um, the U.S., as compared to Germany, does not face its history at all. We leave, we do a lot of leaving out. It's not that it's a lie. It's just being written by white men, you know, and it's very, very disheartening. Um, to watch what goes on. And the only way you really can get more in-depth um, information is either by going to BBC or um, you have to get off the commercial media because that is owned by six mega corporations and they are not going to provide certain kinds of information that people need. Um, and of course, we can go on with the voting issues and college debt and on and on. And the lower you are on the economic um, spectrum, the more you are, you suffer. And, and can, it's, it's becoming impossible really to get out of, of where, you, where you are. So your book is very timely. Un unfortunately, you know, but it's it's good. Hopefully people who need to read it will read it, you know. So thank you very much. And thanks for the, the, the presentation. Thank you so much, Barbara, for, for your warm praise and also touching on examples from the U.S., which I might not be fully familiar with. Um, some of them, yes, but of course, I think marginalization processes happen everywhere in the world. So it's yeah. also not about uh, villainizing a certain country or a certain region. Even in the Arab region, there would be Arab on Arab racism, where I, I, I don't know <laughs> so why why would people yeah, think it, they're it, it's, it, yeah, it's the other. It's but interesting the, that you mentioned that because here in California, um, they're start they're Push, pushing legislation to make it illegal to discriminate based on caste system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't think about, but that would be, you know, Indian on Indian or whatever, um, you know, societies have those caste systems. So, so it's interesting that you, you mentioned that, but yeah, they're trying to, um, they're trying to get re legislation passed where the, caste discrimination is is um, prohibited so absolutely yes and um i think also that the experience of being displaced or being um a refugee even if that label you know has some of the connotation and a bitter aftertaste it's about the involuntary travel it's about not people making a choice choice to go for a better job opportunity or because they love that or because they married someone and follow them but it's because they have to because otherwise uh, they would have loved remaining in their home country so i think this adds also some of the bittersweet um taste to that book because many of them never wanted to leave their homes so yeah. um they they especially if you speak to Syrians, some of them even under Bashar I mean who's still ruling but before the events 
they would never want it to leave. So um, I, I keep mentioning the last chapter by the poet. He said, whenever there's a war, one of the quotes are very um, sad, you know, like he said, whenever there's a war, there's a new wave coming. And if if we look at, at the pattern of migration, primarily it's people who had a war in their country. So Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, um, all those have um, not that agency behind that. So I think um, many of those people we interviewed or who've been writing the um, chapters have also been reflecting on that and, and have also been proud. It's not only about sadness, it's also about making a new beginning, starting a new life and, and uh, um, feeling more of a home, you know, although um, uh, it's, it's a hybrid identity, I think. And it's not a unique thing. I mean, exile being exiled, it's, it's not a unique Arab um, um, experience. Actually, I'm, I'm trying also to connect and read more about histo history and, and the US is a country that had uh, embraced many immigrants uh, in its history. So actually, I'm trying also to look into that. Oh, many, maybe selectively, I see Catherine. <laughs> It depends on the time, yeah. you know, and it depends kind of on some selfish needs, right? So the Baceros yeah. were welcomed in, you know, when we needed farm workers, but now people, you know, are saying, nope, you know, if you're coming. So it just, it kind of, it ebbs and flows depending on kind of the collective. And, and I also think an economic greedy need. You're more accepted if you're bringing something of economic or value than than you are if you're just trying to come to survive. So, absolutely, I totally agree. And that reminds me also of one of the one of the narratives is that a migrant needs to make himself or herself useful, like to prove I'm worthy and I I'm, I'm contributing and I'm doing that. And one of the chapters uh, written by an um, Egyptian neuro uh, neurosurgeon who moves between Berlin and, and, and Cairo in a, in a medical bilateral collaboration, has written about that and has also um, documented the massive brain drain that happens in the global south in general. We know that doctors are much needed everywhere in the pandemic, but the, the latest at least showed how um, many uh, doctors are needed worldwide and Europe in particular is an aging uh, continent. So they need more and more um, nurses, doctors, and so on. And he said that uh, he, he documented that. Maybe just let me share an anecdote with you. Uh, many Egyptian doctors leave the country through the British board exam. So when they uh, do that, it gives them a, a accreditation of their Egyptian uh, medical education. And since or in the past years, the um, place where the exam is being held or the numbers of people taking the exam in Egypt has been more than the number of people taking the exam in the UK. So that just shows you they take the exam, they leave the country immediately. They even refuse their, to take their residency um, in, in Egyptian hospitals and just leave immediately. And um, also opening the visas, because Catherine mentioned the selective border regime, you know, giving visas just right away for medical stuff also shows how people need to, to, to bring benefit to the society. And it's not just because they deserve um, um, to be supported or just diversity is being, uh, um, um, I don't know, pushed, you know, for its own value. Yeah. There's a comment by uh, Sarah Gouda in the chat who says, thanks a lot, Dr. Hanan, very happy and proud of your work. And that is why we've eased the process of citizenship because they need the capacities and calibers in Germany. Um, yes. I sort of want to take the conversation that is happening forward. Um, you know what what uh, Catherine Resnicek mentioned about uh, about a certain kind of labor being welcome initially, and now it's not really welcome. And what you mentioned, um, you and your co-editor saw that there was a blue collar uh, immigration that was happening, and now that has changed to a white collar immigration. What sort of ramifications does that have in terms of, you see that uh, there's an uptick in at least the softer cultural aspects um, of, of Arab voices being becoming more outspoken. So do you think that is connected with the blue collar versus white collar immigration as well? 
Um, that's a very good question. And uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity um, to reflect on it. Um, I definitely think that 20, 30, 40 years ago, when the first uh, migrants came, and, and, and when I mentioned blue collar, I, um, the, it, it was mainly Palestinian Lebanese refugees fleeing the civil war in Lebanon or fleeing the camps and um, in, in Palestine. So um, they came really for survival. So it's not um, because they have a degree or they want to study or anything just for survival. And back then the uh, laws were very restrictive. Um, so if they sought asylum, they were not allowed to work. They're not allowed to send their kids to school. This is a discriminatory process, right? So you basically force them to stay in a loop of poverty. Many of them had to go and and um, open their own restaurants, you know, use their talents they could that had not necessarily qualifications or degrees. But um, uh, so um, this is also an explanation why there are many um, restaurants, you know, in that field. Why um, the do you say gastronomy? The 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 um, uh, the, the the culinary arts are so vibrant because people they they just go into the entrepreneur business and they have no they don't have to impress anyone in a hiring process. They just <laughs> invest their own money and that's it. But it also opened the way to some shadowy uh, underground activities to earn money. So because they were not, because they were expelled from the formal market. So um, for example, drugs or other types of um, criminality. So I'm not saying it does not exist. What we contest in the book, the name Arab club, and there are even investigative pieces that say the, the methods of the police are very weird in, 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 in putting the statistics together. So if you're familiar with names in the Arab region, like Ahmed or Muhammad is a very common name. So you cannot put one family and say, okay, anyone who like using racial profiling. So anyone with a, with a name Muhammad is automatically a part of the clan. This does not make sense. Or big families, you know, like they're, they're having big families. So there could be extended families. One or two of them are criminals. Doesn't mean that the rest mm -hmm. of them are. But this is how the police operate. So it just puts the numbers of possible suspects and inflate them. Another funny statistic from the police in Hamburg was that they, in a, in a published statistic, they counted that Arabs constitute 29% of the criminality in the main train station. If, if, if you come to uh, some main, um, the train central stations sometimes are not really nice places to be in, especially after uh, hours, you know, so, and it, what happened is it was that one particular person who happened to be of Arab origin, he's the one responsible for the 29% of the whatever <laughs> criminal acts. <laughs> so it just makes you think about the methods of counting or what could qualify as a crime. You know, like um, if you're familiar with some Mediterranean habits in weddings, people would go into the kozo, you know, like with cars and, and keep uh, you honking, you know, in celebration of the young couple. This would be a crime and this would go into the Arab clan uh, conflation of crimes. <laughs> so so it's 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 I know it's uh, it's not as funny as it is, but it's this is how stereotypes are being built. This is how lack of nuance and also a lack of critical reporting happens. So sorry for those side stories. The point is because your question was heading elsewhere. The point is that um, the blue collar and, and that generation, not only Arabs, many generations said um, 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 stay silent, stay low, don't speak your native language you don't um like this is what happened in the 60s 70s 80s and nowadays the white collar or the intellectual the educated they are more vocal they know their rights more they know that they can contribute uh, they will not just sit and and not be critical if they witness something they don't like so i think these frictions also um or lack of silence and actively contributing to a changing public sphere could intimidate some of the, I would say, I, it doesn't have even to be right wing. It could be just conservative people who see that their society is changing and they're not understanding why it changes. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine if many Europeans come and settle in some rural areas in Egypt, some people there would be also unnerved about the cultural invasion happening and change of traditions and, ha and, 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 and lifestyles. So I think what we need is a dialogue and people engaging on a human level and then we could see how maybe there are patterns that are similar. Socioeconomic marginalization hits also Germans. 
as equally as it could hit um, people, um, Arab migrants as well. So they could connect on that level. I think it's good. I also but... want. Yeah, I just want to thank Sarah Aguda because she's an old friend and colleague. So I'm very happy that she came. Thank you, Sarah. I suppose it goes back to that uh, quote that we keep hearing in India. Um, there's enough in the world to go around for people's needs, but for not people's greed. And uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. So systemic marginalization does uh, affect across citizenships. All right. So I see that we are coming to the end of the hour. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Hanan Bhatta. This is this is an amazing, amazing tea launch event for us, and we're so glad that you decided to come uh, to the Media Club and launch pre-launch the book with us in a way. And uh, thank you so much to uh, all the participants and attendees. I see some some people have had to join other meetings or have had. Uh, their lunch break end, so they've left a little early. Just to finish uh, with a few announcements, uh, we are doing a special session in October. Uh, I just added the link in chat. It's for a survey where we want to hear your opinion on the top media literacy resources for teaching in the 2020s. If you click on the link, a short survey opens when you can tell us about your favorite, uh, the latest book and latest other resources that you either use in class or you think should be used in class um, across K-12, across university, um, for students, for teachers, for um, NGO employees, for public advocates, the works. Um, another announcement that I wanted to make was we will be launching a new webinar series on inequalities in the education. I've just put the link in chat. Um, the first of the event uh, is happening on the 21st of September. And this is going to be uh, by doctors Andrea Medrado and Isabella Vega. Uh, they're discussing the new book called Media Activism, Autism, and the Fight Against Marginalization in the Global South. Um, I've added a link specifically to that particular event as well, as well as the overall webinar series in chat as well. So I will see you on the 21st of September. Uh, we did have something scheduled for the AI in the Classroom webinar series. Um, but a speaker is facing natural calamity in their area. So their computers and internet is going to be down. So we're going to have to postpone that session. And we'll see you on the 21st of September. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Professor Bhatt. Thank you so much Thanks. for inviting me once again. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Davina. Another good, a good, insightful session to learn and to apply. Things are not in isolation and we need to start understanding that we're part of, not above, you know, so we can make changes. Anyway, enjoy your you're up to evening already, probably. And I don't you're you too. You're up to the evening. So enjoy. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Barbara. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye for now. Thanks, Davina. <laughs>